Welcome again to the ACD branch of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. My name is Bradley Innes and I'm a council member. Tonight, we take an important issue, which is the February 1st military coup, which overthrew Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy Party. Myanmar has a troubled history with the Myanmar Armed Forces, the Tatmadaw, which has overthrown the legitimate government of Myanmar on several occasions throughout the 20th and 21st century and been involved in deadly conflicts with the ethnic minorities within Myanmar. This has in turn resulted in a pattern of unsettled relationships between Myanmar and most of the international community, which seems to be recurring as violence erupts throughout, throughout the country post Feb coup. It may be that the resolve of the international community, especially in the West, is waning in the face of another period of Tatmadaw style dictatorship, especially as many other challenges such as COVID-19, trade and environment are now coming to a head. Tonight, to help us understand these issues more clearly, we are joined by Professor Nicholas Farrelly of the University of Tasmania. Nicholas is a great friend of the AAA, having been our guest on several occasions, as well as being an author of many articles of the Australian Outlook. Nicholas is currently the head of social science at the University of Tasmania. After graduating the Australian National University with first class honours, and the University Medal in Asian Studies. He completed his Masters in Philosophy and Diploma in Philosophy at Balliol College in the University of Oxford, where he is a Rhodes Scholar. In 2006, Nicholas founded the new Mandela, a website which has gone on to become a preeminent public forum in Southeast Asian Studies. He was previously Deputy Director of the Coral Bell School in Asia Pacific Affairs and Director of the ANU Myanmar Research Center an institute he helped establish in 2015. From 2017 to 19, Nicholas was an Associate Dean at the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific. In 2020, he was appointed the Board of Australian ASEAN Council. So without further ado, please take it away, Nicholas. Thanks very much, Bradley, and good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be part of the Australian Institute of International Affairs ACT Branches Lecture Series, and I really do appreciate the opportunity to engage with you all this evening. Um, I just need to make sure that everything's working smoothly in terms of the technology before we rumble into it. Um, Bradley, if you could give me the thumbs up that, uh, that you can see my screen. Perfect. Wonderful. All right. And on that note, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the first Australians on whose lands we meet and by paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, as Bradley said, I'm down here in Hobart in Lutruwita, Tasmania, um, and uh, we are on the lands of the Palawa peoples. And I think it's important that we acknowledge, particularly when we are discussing matters of regional and global importance, uh, the challenging historical and contemporary uh, uh, challenges that we have faced here in Australia as well. And I, I know that there are people who are dialing into this evening's presentation from all around the country. And I certainly hope that there are others from around the world who'll have a chance to reflect on the lecture that I'm about to deliver. Um, to, to get uh, underway, I'd like to also uh, acknowledge uh, one of my dear friends, uh, another Myanmar specialist, Professor Sean Turnell, who, as I think uh, most of you around the Zoom room this evening will appreciate, has been locked up since soon after Myanmar's 1st of February 2021 coup. Um, there are over 7,000 other people, uh, most of them Myanmar citizens, who have also been locked up over recent months. Uh, more than 1,200 people have been killed. And I think we all appreciate that this is an incredibly distressing situation for the Myanmar people and for those of us uh, who have committed ourselves to seeking to understand this wonderful society and also to work so closely mostly uh, with so many um, uh, friends and collaborators from all around Myanmar. Uh, Sean's situation is one that I think 
uh, we need to consider uh, in light of remarks that he made back on the 20th of August 2019 when addressing the AIIA New South Wales branch. Um, uh, he was confronted with a question about the prospect of a military coup. And what Sean said on that occasion is that he couldn't rule out uh, such a prospect, but he did highlight that it would be really undesirable for Myanmar's progress. And so it's in this context, a context where Professor Turnell has already spent far too many months locked up in Myanmar, that I'm going to do my best to talk through conditions as we face them late in 2021, noting that there are no easy resolutions to the situation in Myanmar, and there's going to be an enormous amount of work to be done, uh, perhaps uh, most significantly uh, by Myanmar's people. The structure of my talk for this evening is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm just going to highlight four scenarios and then I will briefly, to conclude, talk through what I judge might be some options, uh, particularly for policymakers and advocates outside Myanmar. Um, I think we all look at these situations and we wonder uh, what's possible, what's realistic, um, what's desirable. And in explaining these scenarios, I hope that we can come to a greater appreciation of what's at stake here and how it is that the Myanmar people are going to be working through uh, what we all appreciate uh, have often been uh, shocking and traumatic conditions. So to begin my analysis for this evening and from where I sit, which um, as I've already said is in Tasmania right now. I think there was a dark calculation made in Napidor just before the 2021 coup. And that calculation was ultimately that powerful international players distracted by their own geostrategic rivalries and of course diminished uh, by the challenging circumstances during the first year of the global COVID-19 pandemic um, wouldn't be able to mount any adequate response to this kind of military intervention at this time. I think it helps that Myanmar's generals and their enablers in the civilian bureaucracy have a great deal of experience in manipulating regional institutions and the rest of us towards outcomes that have been mostly favorable for the entrenchment of military power. Um, so what this means in practice, of course, is that they've often succeeded in avoiding real scrutiny or consequences. And you all appreciate that the human rights abuses have been legion. Um, with the situation that we face this year, um, we also need to appreciate that the coup hasn't been completely ignored um, and that there are reasons to imagine that the breakdown of state institutions that we've seen this year is going to galvanise a wide range of local, national and regional and indeed global responses and that the situation remains incredibly dynamic. What we have seen though, is that the, the carefully curated and once relatively coherent institutions that had been built up in the period from 2011 to 2021 uh, are now gone. Um, and so whatever Myanmar's future looks like, there will need to be new models of governance that are created. Um, that is going to be an enormous challenge, irrespective of which of the four scenarios that I'm going to step through uh, might actually um, be uh, the one that prevails over time. Um, what we've also seen, of course, is that the new State Administration Council, the SAC, um, uh, was um, somewhat wrong-footed muddle-headed, choose whatever phrase you will, uh, when it expected that its repudiation of the National League for Democracy's uh, late 2020 electoral triumph would then only lead to a certain amount of pushback. Um, instead, what we have all seen as is, is a furious response from the Myanmar people, from ethnic armed groups, and of course, from hundreds of thousands of brave protesters who've taken to the streets. And now we see these new dynamics uh, with different militia forces all seeking to put extra pressure on the generals in Naypyidaw. So to quickly dance across the scenarios before I get into the details. The first scenario is a scenario where the coup is eventually consolidated. And, and let's just, um, agree for the moment that this coup um, has yet to fully succeed. That's 
something that Myanmar hasn't confronted in its recent experience. And yet here we are almost a year after the initial military intervention, and we can still talk in a realistic sense about the lack of final consolidation. That means, of course, that there's a second scenario where the coup fails, um, perhaps something like a revolution prevails. There's a third scenario, which is linked, I'd suggest, to these first two in interesting ways, where centrifugal forces, the kinds of forces pulling permanently at Myanmar's edges, perhaps lead to some further unraveling of the system as a whole. The fourth scenario, the scenario that I think we would all like to see Myanmar avoid is, is some type of implosion, um, perhaps with much more significant warfare than we've seen in recent decades, and then perhaps the possibility of foreign intervention. So let's get started with this first scenario where the coup is eventually consolidated. The military, of course, has fought hard this year to maintain its control of state institutions. Uh, it has a posture, no doubt about it, that has also generated sustained opposition. Uh, and that's opposition both in the Bama Buddhist heartlands of the country, but across many of the ethnic minority dominated peripheries as well. Um, in a consolidation scenario, there will still be resistance to the army to other security agencies like the police and the intelligence services and to any other representatives of government authority. I think we'd have to anticipate that even if the coup is finally consolidated, that there will continue to be armed opposition. So that means more violence, more displacement, uh, perhaps appalling human rights, uh, rights abuses would continue and indeed economic paralysis. Um, it would likely also put a lot of pressure on Myanmar's neighbours because in this scenario, people will still try to leave Myanmar. Um, so Thailand, of course, needs to respond and potentially countries like India and Bangladesh also become become highly relevant. Uh, the Rohingya and other marginalized groups, they're going to continue to su suffer greatly, I'd guess, in such a scenario. Um, and so this isn't a, a good news story. This is a story of real consequence and consequence that would carry on for years to come. And so while when they rolled the tanks out into central Naypyidaw to originally take charge, the government may have imagined that it was going to be a reasonably straightforward situation, it has proved anything but. What we see now, of course, is that Naypyidaw, the the, the tailor-made um, dictator's paradise, a place that was created for exactly these kinds of scenarios, is now needing to project its power out across the country in many different directions. And that puts an enormous amount of pressure on Myanmar's uh, government fighting forces. And of course, it puts pressure on the civilian bureaucracy. We see some of those consequences uh, through the education system, the health system and elsewhere. Um, things are really hard. And one of the other reasons why things are still hard in a scenario like this is highlighted um, by this snapshot of electoral results from the past decade or so in Naypyidaw. There are eight lower house constituencies. You can see them all on the screen. In 2010, at the non-democratic elections, the Union Solidarity and Development Party won all of the seats. The 2012 by-election, when the National League for Democracy, spearheaded, of course, by Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, was able to compete in half of those seats. It won all of them. And then the 2015 and the 2020 elections show that Naypyidaw, that supposed dictator's paradise, a place where the military strongmen were supposed to feel comfortable, is a place where Aung San Suu Kyi's team triumphs time after time when it comes to the outcomes at the ballot box. I think this is just a crucial point to bear in mind in a coup consolidation scenario. Many people who work for Myanmar's military government do not agree with the military government. That will have consequences in many different directions. Which brings me, of course, to scenario two, which is about the failure of the coup. And this is a scenario where perhaps a revolution of some sort prevails. And I think the signals late this year from the ASEAN foreign ministers about the legitimacy of the post-coup regime, uh, a further indication that even within very orthodox foreign yeah. policy circles, there are some misgivings, actually some quite grave misgivings about the legitimacy of the military's authoritarian rule. And so in this scenario, Myanmar's 
pre-coup political arrangements would probably provide a bit of inspiration for the management of the country's diverse geographies. But actually a, a revolutionary regime, if it was to come to power, could be doing some things that are quite different. They would also though be grappling with increased state fragility, potentially with um, the continuation of some of the old conflicts. I'm not sure that any Myanmar government in such a scenario is going to be able to bring everybody happily to the one table all the time. So even in a best case scenario, if we put it in those terms, it's unlikely that there's going to be a sustained consensus about Myanmar's future political direction. So what this means is that even in a scenario where the coup fails and we can all see indications that that could be the outcome next year or the year after, it would still be really messy. And of course, the victors in such a scenario would have to get on with the hard work of consolidating themselves and seeking to ensure that the kinds of, of violent militarized politics that have been so prevalent across Myanmar's post-independence history are perhaps once and for all a thing of the past. But that's, that's a really big hope. In this kind of scenario, you're probably all wondering where does Aung San Suu Kyi herself fit in? Um, I think it's, it's hard to know for sure, because of course this period where she's been held in detention throughout 2021 will have taken a toll. Many of her key lieutenants have needed to flee or to go into hiding. Uh, there are of course a large number of NLD power brokers who are also locked up. Um, this means that if the coup fails, if if other groups were to ultimately prevail, Aung San Suu Kyi would have a period where she'd be looked to to provide leadership. Um, but she's now perhaps of an age where other leaders would need to step through. And if the NLD was going to continue to be such a potent force, at election after election, we would need to see a new generation of democratic leaders stepping to the forefront. And I can imagine that some of those leaders are doing their utmost right now to ensure that the, the national unity government uh, and that many of the country's ethnic political interests are working to the extent that it's possible towards the kind of outcome that leads to the failure of the coup and the consolidation of a new political regime. Those first two scenarios interact with the third, which is about the prospect of centrifugal forces potentially pulling the country to pieces. And this has been the worry of the country's democratic and military leaders going back right to uh, the country's uh, independence period in the late 1940s. Avoiding fragmentation has in in fact, been the stated objective of all of Myanmar's post-independence governments. And the Myanmar army has been pretty successful overall in the way that it has co-opted ethnic minority groups and their armed organizations. And so that has been a process that they've learned from over time, which has avoided the cataclysmic outcomes that un unraveling might imply. Although, and I think this is where under current circumstances with so much upheaval, we can imagine that there might be declarations of independence, could never say never from, I don't know, a Kachin land, a, a Kortele, which is, would be an independent Karen homeland, um, perhaps from a Wa union, if the United Wa State Army uh, determined that this was, was their best option. Um, You'd imagine in such a scenario that foreign powers would need to be brought into the picture for, for credibility and also for resources, but it's also possible that some quasi state institutions like in Wa areas or Kachin areas or Karen areas could over time perhaps incrementally perhaps without drawing a lot of attention to themselves, actually create some alternative modes of governance, uh, alternative political identities at the margins of, of what might prove to be a crumbling Myanmar state. Um, in that scenario, external actors, of course, might be prepared to provide some economic and security support beyond what they've done historically. And what that might mean is that formal recognition would then come over time. Uh, does Myanmar survive uh, this scenario playing out over the medium term? Um, I'm not sure, but I think we need to bear in mind that under current circumstances, such things are theoretically possible.
let's at least put them in that category for now. It's a category, of course, that would mean the undoing of some of the relationships between ethnic leaders and their military backers, their Napidor-based military backers. There have been huge investments in the infrastructure that have allowed for co-optation across Myanmar's borderlands. Uh, that infrastructure um, wouldn't disappear overnight, but can it be applied in different ways? I'd guess it probably can. And what does that then mean for the, the military headquartered in Naypyidaw, for its self-imagining of Myanmar's future and its own supreme role in determining what happens politically, economically, culturally, and in so many other realms? What we have, of course, is a broad outline of ethnic fault lines across the country. And it has been somewhat heartening in light of the anti-coup resistance that some of these ethnic categories and what they have tended to mean in recent experience has started to break down. We do though have other fault lines that you all appreciate around this Zoom room are really crucial, uh, particularly when it comes to Myanmar's religious majority, uh, the dominant Buddhist population, and the various minority religions. And we can see, particularly along the border with Bangladesh, uh, just how challenging um, the circumstances for some religious minorities in Myanmar have been over recent decades. And through any of these scenarios, I think it's fair to judge that such difficulties are likely to persist. Which then brings me to scenario number four. And this is a scenario where, and again, we're speculating, but I think it's important that we do so attentive to the historical conditions, but also mindful of the ways that uh, Myanmar's circumstances have changed so abruptly in recent times, particularly since the coup. In these contexts, it's possible that there could be some implosion. Uh, perhaps where there's no clear mandate for any post-coup government. So that means the military in Naypyidaw struggle to consolidate. Uh, other forces don't quite get to the, to the threshold where they feel comfortable as an alternative government. That means sparring perhaps between significant military factions, maybe other political players get involved in messy ways. I'd suggest that such a scenario, when you think it through, would also then be predicated and would probably encourage the involvement of neighboring powers. And I'm thinking particularly of Thailand, China, and India, uh, maybe even Bangladesh. Um, if you work this scenario through a few more steps, you can find that, okay, the United States and its allies, countries like Japan and Australia would have interests and potentially would see themselves as needing to be actively involved. And so that means the outcomes would be seriously unpredictable. Uh, but if the judgment formed in some nearby country that core strategic interests were at stake, and so, for example, the security of China's pipelines across central Myanmar, then such a scenario would actually be primed for regional armed, armed forces. And I, I speculate like this um, very cautiously. They may be very reluctantly required to become involved. And so, in this scenario four, a scenario of perhaps implosion, war, foreign intervention, rebuilding Myanmar would, even if there was a short period of such increased international involvement, this would be a really major undertaking. Um, it would have far reaching consequences for Myanmar's coherence um, and perhaps for its very existence as a unitary nation state. That's how serious this could become. I think everybody's aware that, that Myanmar's histories of civil war have meant that there are lots of guns, there are lots of trained fighters, there are plenty of people uh, within the country who have been prepared to go toe to toe under different political circumstances. And when you go back deeper into Myanmar's history, you do find that there were periods when uh, foreign forces were much more heavily involved. Um, that involvement uh, has tended to come at great cost to the Myanmar people. And so scenario four here is a scenario that of course, everyone would want to, to, would want to avoid and yet I don't think it's impossible uh, that with this coup, with the, the, the forces that are now building up, that we might um, actually need to consider 
uh, how these really unfortunate scenarios like scenario three and scenario four might ultimately play out. So finally, just as, as I bring this analysis to a close and as we move towards um, perhaps engaging with some of your questions and comments about this situation, I, I'd like to think through some of the options for foreign policy makers and for international advocates. Um, if we consider for a moment these four scenarios as interlinked versions of Myanmar's potential development since this coup, um, I'd suggest that what we can then do with the scenarios is start to reflect on the humanitarian, the economic and the political consequences of some of the serious forces that have been unleashed over the past year. Um, so opportunities in this context to build effective political institutions are going to require really careful attention to the range of calculations made by the Myanmar military itself within the, the well-established ethnic armed organizations, and then across the spectrum of the new militia and political organizations that have been catalyzed by the coup. And in this context, policymaking and advocacy interests, and so this means within Southeast Asia and beyond, will also need to confront the possibility of further deterioration, meaning that the decisions might actually get harder and the resources required to avoid even more complex outcomes will be more significant over time. However you carve it though, and you know, this is such a sad situation for the people of Myanmar in any of these scenarios, I think we can all see that Myanmar is going to lag far behind its neighbors for years to come. And so while there has been optimism around Myanmar for most of the past decade, um, and yes, there have still been issues in ethnic areas, especially uh, along the border with uh, Bangladesh, where the Rohingya have been treated so appallingly. What we're now seeing is a much more widespread impoverishment of the Myanmar people, a shrinking economy, the persistent threat of violence. And those of us who have close Myanmar friends uh, perhaps have some appreciation of what that has meant in recent experience. It's often been terrible. Uh, stark limitations uh, beyond the, the normal li limitations imposed on us by the pandemic for foreign involvement in Myanmar circumstances. And then of course, uh, the prospect of new political disagreements also adding fuel to the many old enmities. Um, this means that for tens of millions of people, we're talking about some, some really bleak situations that need to be considered. And avoiding the worst hardships and the most damaging violence is going to be a big job. And I'd suggest that it means the international community needs to stay really heavily involved beyond this year. And of course, Myanmar through some months of 2021 was receiving a fair bit of media attention, but we all see it. Uh, the media loses interest. The issues aren't as lively or fresh. Um, perhaps the video footage doesn't quite cut it for being broadcast on the evening news. And a country like Myanmar with all of these issues at stake fades from attention. Um, and we can appreciate that for policymakers and for advocates, there are also so many other issues uh, that are so important right now. And yet for Myanmar, I'd suggest this is one of those moments uh, of truth that require action and indeed some creativity. And so what kinds of responses should policymakers and advocates be considering? And here's my very quick list. And then I'm just going to jump into some perhaps more concrete ways that we consider how these responses play out from next year and beyond. Um, we can see, of course, that um, we all need to be offering words and messages at different levels and in different ways. Uh, most of the time, I, I think those responses, uh, as meaningful as they might be in the moment, uh, tend not to lead to the kinds of long-term outcomes that Myanmar needs. Except, of course, where we see um, uh, bravery, courage, um, a real sense that somebody is stepping out of their comfort zone as we did earlier in the year at the United Nations uh, where Myanmar's ambassador Ujo Motun um, made some remarkable interventions uh, and disavowed the government that he uh, had originally been sent 
to the United Nations to represent um, and sought to position himself with the anti-coup forces. Um, then, of course, we move through the categories of, of perhaps what we could call countermeasures and proactive measures, a range of different tools that have been used in different contexts, including, as we're all well aware, in Myanmar um, over the decades. Um, these are the sorts of measures um, that when used effectively and in combination, um, ideally in coalition with, with other like-minded countries um, or with other non-government interest groups, um, do end up uh, providing support to those who are seeking um, to ensure that violence doesn't escalate, provide support to those who are um, actively undermining uh, the confidence of the military leadership, while also, of course, um, imposing some limitations uh, on military leaders, on their close family members, and on those who might be seeking to benefit commercially uh, from uh, the military's intervention earlier in the year. Um, those measures, of course, are the subject of a great deal of public and scholarly debate. Um, do any of them do enough on their own to lead to the kinds of outcomes uh, that many of us would like to see in Myanmar over the years ahead? Um, I think that the consensus is that it is a hard, long, and often frustrating journey to get either countermeasures or proactive measures or so some combination of the two um, to deliver the sorts of outcomes that so many people in Myanmar seek. And so then, of course, the question is, is there something more, something more interventionist? And as I think many of you will have noted earlier in Myanmar's 2021 crisis, um, there were calls from within Myanmar and from elsewhere uh, for um, the invocation of the responsibility to protect uh, a suggestion at least that the international community um, should do more, more quickly and with more force to ensure that Myanmar's situation doesn't spiral out of control. And anti-coup forces, understandably, are calling for the world to do more. So what therefore do those options look like? And I'm just going to, to dance across these quickly before we can open up today's uh, conversation. I'd really love to hear your questions, your comments, your feedback, your thoughts on how we can collectively work through these four scenarios. Um, starting here, with a list of, of three potential ways that these options can be brought together. There's one uh, option that we might call the people power option, basically meaning um, that those outside the country with influence double down on the anti-coup forces and hope they win. This is, would be uh, a set of um, strategic options aligned with scenario number two. Does that mean that scenario number two is straightforward? Of course not. Um, but is it perhaps a, a policy response, an advocacy response that's well aligned with what we would understand because of the democratic mandate of the NLD government that was overthrown in the coup because of the sort of outrage that we've seen month after month across Myanmar. Um, literally every part of the country has seen huge protests, some of which go on in defiance of the crackdowns that have come uh, from the Napidor based military government. Uh, we can all see the attraction of focusing on what people power can mean in Myanmar's current conundrum. Perhaps another way of consolidating some of these policy responses we could call buckle up and it gives me no satisfaction to consider what this means in practice because this is actually a, a a terribly flawed way of seeking to ensure that Myanmar doesn't, as I was implying earlier, spiral into the abyss. And this would be to have policy responses that are engaging at the margins of these messy wars, seeking to minimise the, the human costs of displacement and also seeking to ensure that Myanmar's people are not impoverished um, so, so much that the consequences for individuals, for families, and indeed for entire communities uh, mean that they get wiped out. Uh, nobody wants to see that, but there are so many reasons to imagine that in some of our scenarios, potentially scenario one, certainly scenarios three and four, um, that we all need to be ready for Myanmar to take some further turns for the worse. And if that's 
the way that it plays out. Um, we all need to be able to buckle up and support our friends in Myanmar to the greatest extent possible. And then just before I wrap up, you're all probably wondering, is, is there some other way that this comes to an end? And I have been wondering about the escalation of violence uh, since the, the rains began to stop. Um, I think you all appreciate that it's the dry season in Myanmar when it's easiest to move troops and equipment around uh, in some parts of the country. This has historically been considered the, the fighting season. Um, we don't know yet what that's going to look like um, over the months to come, but we will by March or April be in a much better position to assess um, what level of violence uh, the State Administration Council has been prepared to use against its own people. And if it turns out, as we do fear, that the SAC has um, gone with all of its war weapons against vulnerable populations over the months to come, is that then going to mean that a different kind of policy response, indeed perhaps a much more significant intervention is then going to be called upon? Uh, and will there be those who end up answering that call? I'm not sure, I think the history of ASEAN level diplomacy of the complex geopolitics of this region and of the challenges faced by so many other countries right now would suggest that this isn't the direction that we're heading in. And yet when we consider policy interventions, support for democratic systems, um, the importance of the experiment in a more inclusive, um, more dynamic, ultimately fairer and more transparent politics that was underway in Myanmar, um, might we get to a point uh, where there is a confluence of, of interests and events that then leads somebody somewhere to determine that enough is enough. So in that context, I'm keen to continue the conversation for this evening. I'm going to stop my screen share. Um, I'm uh, mindful uh, that um, organizing this sort of discussion over Zoom isn't entirely straightforward. I'm very grateful uh, to the team at the Australian Institute of International Affairs ACT branch uh, for their very warm welcome and for their invitation to present this evening's lecture on Myanmar. I'm really keen that there are Australian voices involved in these sorts of discussions. Uh, those of us who have worked closely with our friends and collaborators in Myanmar um, are of course, so distraught about what has happened this year. And I think the more that we can be talking about these issues, the more that we can be maintaining our public interest in Myanmar's situation, uh, the better it's going to be for the Myanmar people, and ultimately the better it's going to be for the entire region. So on that note, uh, thanks again, Bradley, Heath and everyone else. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for a very informative um, lecture especially going through some of the dark possibilities of Mount Mount's future and some of the internal factors that um, play a, a part in the post and pre-coup politics. However, firstly, I'd like to remind viewers at home that they can send questions in via the Q&A function uh, below in the, um, the Zoom chat. However, as chair, I'd like to ask the first question to you, Nicholas. Um, you've touched over this just at the end though, but I'd like to point out again that you spoke about um, international factors and how they could influence potential future for Myanmar. I'd like to point towards regional players, especially ASEAN, and especially towards the upcoming chair, Cambodia, and I have them spoken about um, excluding the Tatmadaw from ASEAN in the future. Do you find that might be a, a, a potential way to, um, to keep Myanmar peaceful in the future and, and see a peaceful resolution to the conflict there? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, Bradley. Um, so I think the, the starting point here is we need to appreciate the extent to which Myanmar's generals care about the endorsement from ASEAN. Of course, since Myanmar was welcomed into the ASEAN grouping, the country has sought to utilise that status um, as a protective mechanism. It's allowed for a series of Myanmar governments going back to the 
to the last hardline military dictatorship to benefit from support uh, across this diverse regional grouping. For Myanmar to be excluded, and of course there have been signals as recently as last month that, that that's something that is being considered in ASEAN capitals in a, a very serious and severe way um, would, of course, be a reminder to the Myanmar generals of the consequences of some of their activities since the coup. Um, of course, ASEAN itself is, is not a club of democracies. Um, there are a wide range of different political systems that have found a comfortable home within ASEAN's norms for diplomacy. Um, could it be that we end up therefore uh, with Myanmar continuing to get pressure, including under Cambodia's uh, chairing of the ASEAN grouping, I'd suggest that that's something that um, needs to be looked at really closely. Um, ASEAN hasn't um, always covered itself in glory when it comes to the way that it's responded to these national and regional crises. And of course, because of the ways uh, that many uh, ASEAN power brokers think about non-interference, it's hard to imagine a situation where ASEAN pushes too quickly or too far and therefore ends up alienating not just the generals in Naypyidaw, um, but some of those elsewhere in ASEAN who are also anxious about the ways um, that intervention might play out in their own fraught and sensitive political circumstances. So yeah, I have an, an, uh, we have another question here from Miriam Warmers. What do you think are the current prospects of Sean Turnell? Will he be convicted? What can be done for Australia to help him? It's a great question. I don't know if he'll be convicted. And of course, we're all still somewhat in the dark about exactly what Sean um, is facing, that the charges we understand are serious. They're also linked, um, we appreciate, to the circumstances of Aung San Suu Kyi and, and potentially to other senior NLD leaders. The fact that Sean was working so closely and so effectively as an economic advisor in Myanmar means, from my perspective at least, that we should be doing whatever we can um, to uh, highlight his plight, but also to be um, uh, mindful of the, the really subtle, sophisticated, sensitive work that's going to be needed to ensure that Sean can be released at the earliest possible time. Uh, for the Australian government, I can imagine this is really difficult and I have no doubt that there are enormous resources that are being put into supporting Sean uh, and to seeking to come to the best possible outcome at the earliest possible moment. Um, and yet I think we're all um, also, uh, concerned that Sean's situation is one that hasn't been resolved so far. Um, and that perhaps means that he is now um, caught up in a range of dynamics that will just need to be worked through. I certainly hope that um, his health is being looked after uh, and that he's um, receiving whatever um, care and compassion can be made available to him. Um, because certainly those of us who've had the privilege of working closely with Sean appreciate uh, his generosity, his creativity, um, and his overall humanity when it comes to his amazing work in Myanmar. Uh, Sean has done things in the country that, that nobody else has done to support uh, economic development. And we all uh, hope that he can come home to Australia one day soon. Thank you. Manny Kingsley writes in, how substantive is the Rohingya participation in the parallel civilian government? Are there any prospects domestically or internationally of the perpetrators of the 2017 massacres being held to account? Again, really important question and one that we should not lose focus on. Um, so there are um, uh, a range of legal processes that are underway, uh, including in The Hague, uh, where the Gambia um, has sought to um, draw to the international community's attention uh, the allegation of uh, genocide that was conducted in 2017 in Myanmar's borderlands adjacent to Bangladesh. Of course, at that time, almost a million people fled across the border. Um, we all appreciate that that was a particularly uh, drastic time. Uh, and the Rohingya um, were 
uh, from then on excluded from uh, so much uh, that was, I think, important about that transitional period, the period when the NLD government was um, uh, consolidating itself in Naypyidaw, uh, something that a few of us um, uh, could have conceived of, yes, but were still somewhat surprised by. And the fact that the NLD under Aung San Suu Kyi uh, was there in Naypyidaw, uh, working hard to build the democratic system, while then at the same time as we saw late in 2019, uh, defending uh, Myanmar and, um, and as a result, the, the military against those charges that were leveled in The Hague, a simply remarkable circumstance. What can we say about the involvement of the Rohingya uh, since the coup? My understanding is that Rohingya voices um, have been somewhat prominent within um, the NUG and within related entities that have been seeking to drive a different kind of politics. Um, my um, appreciation from this distance is that there are certainly some people in Myanmar who have considered that the country's response under Aung San Suu Kyi to the 2017 Rohingya pog pogroms was completely inappropriate and that they would like to make amends for that, meaning that uh, the NUG has signaled that they would like to see the Rohingya uh, more fully included in um, the kind of new political system that might emerge if this coup ultimately fails, being the scenario too that I talked about this evening. Um, would that be a smooth ride for the Rohingya? I would suggest it, it probably wouldn't be, uh, but are there at least some signals uh, that key people are thinking about these issues, perhaps wondering about how they will do it differently and do it better in the future? Um, certainly, we seem to be picking up those signals and, and that for me at least um, is a really great start. Thank you. Another question that's just come in from, from Penny Wensley. She thanks you first for your presentation and wants to, wants to know more about China's role and their influence in particular, its relation with the military coup and leaders. Yeah, thanks very much, Penny. And uh, China, of course, is um, a key player here, partly because there are about two and a half million Chinese or former Chinese, uh, and by that I mean former uh, PRC residents or citizens who live on the Myanmar side of the border. They are, as we all appreciate, an enormous part of Myanmar's economy. And then there are the really sensitive infrastructure developments that various Chinese entities um, have put in place over recent years. Um, the oil and gas pipeline that cuts right across the, the middle of the country is perhaps the best known example. There are also port facilities. Um, there are major industrial zones. There are plenty of things that China has done at scale uh, that have led to employment, led to to um, economic development and uh, ultimately served to advance um, the agenda of turning Myanmar into a more peaceful and we hope also more prosperous country with the coup. Uh, and again, there are, there are different thoughts on this in the analytical community, but I think one um, important uh, framing is that uh, China uh, wasn't all that comfortable with the coup, uh, perhaps didn't have all the notice that they might have anticipated, and that in fact the generals in Naypyidaw had determined on their own account that they were going to push ahead with such a dramatic intervention. Um, my own experience engaging directly with Chinese analysts suggests that they tend to have quite a good understanding of how Myanmar works. That shouldn't surprise us, should it? Um, the, the institutions that are responsible for Myanmar analysis, particularly in Yunnan, uh, have a large number of quite well-trained um, uh, scholars, former diplomats and others who cycle through parts of the Chinese system. The Chinese system, of course, cares more about Myanmar than almost anybody else's system, uh, meaning that they invest serious resources in trying to appreciate what's going on. Um, would they, though, um, have thought that a democracy 
of a managed type with the military in the background and Aung San Suu Kyi on centre stage could continue to advance their interests, my best guess is that they probably could. And that instead, the kind of scenarios we're talking about, whether it's scenario one, two, three or four, these are all scenarios that would be worrisome for Chinese decision makers. And these would be scenarios that I think they would be seeking to moderate to the extent that that's going to be possible in the years to come, because further really dramatic outcomes are likely to, to lead China to need to make tougher choices. And the history of China's engagement in Myanmar is that wherever possible, in my reading, uh, they try to avoid those tough choices. They want something that's uh, a bit more easygoing, a bit more straightforward, um, allows them to get on with business, allows them to do the things that are strategically valuable without having to exert themselves in the way that some of these future contingencies uh, might actually then require. I'd like to change the topic of the, of the talk tonight towards COVID diplomacy. Recently, ex-diplomat Bill Richardson had, had visited uh, Myanmar on invitation by the Tatmadaw. Could this be a potential edge for Western governments, say Australia or others, to see a peaceful transition of, of government in or, or end of conflict in Myanmar through COVID diplomacy? It's a, it's a great point, um, Bradley. And so I think COVID diplomacy in general is going to be an important area for work for some years to come. Um, I think we can all appreciate that while there's a level of triumphalism um, about our freedom days and our opening up, um, the pandemic still has a long way to run, uh, particularly in parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, it's um, important to recognise that Myanmar's own response to the pandemic has been greatly disrupted by the coup and by the political turbulence, the street level conflict and everything else. Um, what I think that now means for Myanmar is that uh, ramping up vaccination efforts, doing so with quality vaccines, doing so in ways that are going to allow Myanmar's health system, which has been under pressure for a long time uh, to come through the other side of the current crises, um, will require international support. Uh, doing this sort of vaccine diplomacy, though, Bradley, I think right now is really tricky um, because understandably, um, even the sort of um, uh, visit that we saw recently uh, from Bill Richardson then leads to a chorus of criticism. There are plenty of people who perhaps judge that this isn't the time for that kind of high level engagement with the senior decision makers in Napidor. Um, that view, of course, would be that uh, the COVID response can wait until uh, Myanmar's generals are put in the queue to face justice for their crimes. Uh, under circumstances when Myanmar has reverted to some form of democratic rule. Um, that perhaps isn't the most pragmatic of perspectives right now, um, but I can certainly appreciate why there are those who feel that we need to be doing things in the right sequence. Um, and that for now, at least, the pressure needs to be focused on the Myanmar generals and on the way that they've conducted themselves since the coup. Thank you. Possibly the last question tonight, Keith McMichael, the branch president, writes in, who might be the proponents of a right to protect strategy to put pressure on the military government? Is there a leadership role for Australia? What about the UN? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Heath. And the, the UN, of course, has been heavily involved in all aspects of Myanmar's transition as it has rolled through um, over the past decade. There are very large um, United Nations compounds. There are uh, big footprints from, from other international agencies that have um, sought to ensure that Myanmar's development um, can continue in ways that support the best interests of its citizens. Um, when it comes to responsibility to protect, um, it's hard to, to see a coalition forming without a, a new catalyst. And I'd suggest that the catalyst that we need to keep an eye on over the months to come is a dramatic deterioration of the humanitarian situation and perhaps accompanied by some uh, significant increase or expansion of the level of Myanmar 
uh, military government operations around the country. Um, if the movement of, of troops and uh, military equipment that we've seen in recent times is an indication of where they're going, uh, then perhaps there, there could be some catalyst that emerges. Um, which countries would be leading it? I, I think that some that have been most outspoken recently um, include the United Kingdom and some uh, other key players within Europe. Um, the United States, of course, uh, has been um, very focused on Myanmar's circumstances since the coup, uh, which we all appreciate came right at the start of the Biden administration's first term. Um, might it be that next year um, the world looks a bit different and that R2P therefore looms larger as something that a, a bigger group of countries can get behind? I'm not sure. Um, I think that some of these um, notions are still sufficiently untested, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, ASEAN regional diplomacy, um, that it's hard to think that there's going to be a, a swift or easy route uh, to getting something like an R2P operation up and running. Uh, but if it was to occur, I'd certainly hope that a country like ours can be playing a meaningful and supportive role, um, because certainly if other countries from beyond uh, the Asia Pacific region were were investing resources and effort, um, then Australia would want to be part of the way that anything like that ended up unfolding. Thank you. Maybe one last question before we go tonight. A number of participants have written in. They want to know, where do you see Myanmar in 10 years' time? Do you see any of your four scenarios which you have pointed out tonight becoming a reality, or do you see something else happening? Yeah, thanks very much. So the baseline for me is that the coup is consolidated and Myanmar slumps into many years of military dictatorship. That's not going to be an easy situation for anyone. I'd suggest that that's the most likely outcome based on the trajectories that we're currently on. And um, that is depressing. There's, there's no other way of putting it. Uh, but if that's what it's come to, uh, it would then be a question of how does the international community support those who need to, to flee the traumas and tragedies of Myanmar, uh, the young people who might want to be educated in countries like our own. At some stage, we know these kinds of military dictatorships do fall. Um, and when the Myanmar military government falls in the years to come, um, we hope that Myanmar people are as well placed as possible to respond and to rebuild their country. I I'd also just want to finally say, though, Bradley, that the scenario that I think is the second most likely is scenario number two. Um, I judge that that scenario is possible. If it's going to happen, though, I think it would be best for everyone if it happened relatively soon. Um, if the coup fails and if the resistance to the coup prevails, uh, then it's important that we are working towards that outcome uh, in uh, a prompt and effective fashion because, um, yeah, the, the hardships here will fall on the next generation of Myanmar people. Uh, it would be amazing to think that they might have the opportunity to build a different kind of political system. Can they do that on their own? Um, history would suggest they can't. Uh, are there opportunities for all of us to be better understanding their circumstances and perhaps providing uh, some useful support? Um, I'd like to think there are. And in that context, I'm not entirely pessimistic. Uh, Bradley and everyone else around the Zoom room, I think that there are things that we can be focused on here that might provide uh, some brighter horizons and better possibilities for the people of Myanmar. Well, I think it's time to draw a line under the uh, conversation there. I would like to thank you, Nicholas, for a very informative afternoon. Um, I, I thank you very much for answering many questions this afternoon. I know you must be busy at the end of, end of semester now. Um, I'm guessing you're busy marking assignments and, and end of your exams. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, um, to, to join us tonight. However, I'd like to turn the chair over just quickly to Heath McMichael, the branch president. He has a few um, um, notices to tell us about, about upcoming events. Thanks, Bradley, and thanks very much, Nicholas, for uh, your very enlightening talk there, if, if not uh, somewhat sobering talk. But uh, looking ahead to uh, branch events next week, uh, we'll have our annual general meeting for 2021. Uh, members uh, are welcome to uh, join us for that. We can take up to, uh, I think now, 50 in the room. 
So the first 50 members who uh, register for that uh, can join us in person. But after that, we will have a uh, talk by a couple of expert speakers from the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And their topic will be uh, new directions in Australia's agricultural trade. So we're looking uh, to uh, very much forward to uh, that talk from our expert uh, speakers. So uh, until next week, uh, do uh, register and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Thanks very much. <laughs>